Have you guys had a good time so far? Awesome, awesome. Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Bethany Barr Phillips. I only have the bar in there that was my maiden name. I'm from South Mississippi originally. And when you get married and you change your name, nobody knows who you are anymore. So uh, because I was still traveling and doing some stuff, we, I just kept that there. And it's just kind of kept its way all the way through. So Bethany Barr Phillips is my name. Um, I am a mom, a wife, uh, a worship leader. And Jeff kind of gave you the, the gamut and the list on that. And um, I'm just excited to be here. I love SLU. We love the team here. I just want to honor them and tell them thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Crow, Dr. Wallace, Dr. J, all the doctors, because I feel like that's what everybody is, right? Uh, I'm just honored to be a part, and not just to like be cohorts together, but to be friends. Because essentially, no matter what you do, no matter where you go in your life, you're going to need to develop relationships and friendships, because that's how great leadership happens in the context of relationship, right? Everybody say right. Okay, I come from a, like, Bapticostal land, so I'm going to need a little interaction. Everybody good with that? Everybody good with Okay. We have a few. We have a few. That's great. Uh, today we're going to talk about leading through the lens of an artist, and before we do that, I'd just love to tell you guys how I came to know the Lord, because I think it's incredibly important to kind of know uh, the shape and the context of where everybody's from. Like I told you, I'm from South Mississippi. Uh, I, we didn't really grow up in church when I was a kid, so some of you may have been, like, going to church in the womb. That was not me. We started going to church when I was about eight or nine, and uh, I felt the Lord call my, my heart. I don't know. Do you guys ever had that moment where you're sitting in the pew or the chair or the aisle, and everything just starts burning inside of you, and you don't understand what's going on? And that was me at nine years old when I heard the gospel for really the first time. And so I went down front, uh, as great Baptists do, and uh, talked to my pastor, and that became just this conversation for the next few weeks. And uh, I really began my journey with the Lord at that moment. Fast forward to seventh grade, my very first student ministry event, and um, my student pastor was incredibly wise because he sat me down right beside him. Uh, we used to do this huge statewide back-to-school thing where I'm from, and so we were there, and I remember watching four women walk out on a platform and lead worship, and I thought to myself, this is what I'm going to do. So immediately, because I say everything I think, uh, as my husband says that about me even today, I looked straight at my student pastor to my right, and I said, that right there is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And just like he still does today, because we still talk regularly, he chuckled at me and he goes, we'll see. And so I, I tell you this because there are going to be moments where you see things that begin to shape who you are. And they're going to be kind of like stamps in your mind about what's to come. And you'll always be able to look back to those things. We fast forward to now, and that's what the Lord's allowed me to do for the last 20-something years, which is crazy because I come from a land where that's not normally an opportunity for me, which is why I want to talk to you about leading through the lens of an artist, all right? Because there are going to be moments where you think, I'm not an artist, this is not for me, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this, and the reality is there's an artist inside of all of us, all right? And I don't want to make that like this weird abstract thing where we're just trying to grasp at stuff. I want to give us like some concrete things to roll around. How do we lead through the lens of an artist? How do we look at something and say, I know this is what God's calling me to do. How do I get there? That's where we're going. Sound good? All right, all right. So at my house, we have chickens. Does anybody have chickens at their house? Yeah, big chicken energy in the room, right? All right. So we have chickens at my house. My husband is from Alabama. We settled there uh, right after we got married. And so now I am from Alabama. Fast forward to life now. Uh, Mississippi and Alabama are different despite popular belief. Just putting that out there. So we have chickens at my house. We have two coops. We have the coop up at the top of the road. Uh, it's our red coop. And then we have the blue coop over here to the side, kind of tucked back uh, on the side of our house. And in the red coop, we have standard chickens. We have like the red ones, the white ones, the brown ones. They all have like traditional names. If you grew up on a farm, you know, they're like Bard Rocks or Rhode Island Reds or whatever. They lay these like brown eggs, right? And then to uh, the left of our house, we have the blue coop. And in the blue coop, we have what we call the pretentious fancy chickens. 
They have like the plumes on top of their head and they walk like they're better than you. Like they're real sassy chickens, right? They lay like lavender eggs and blue eggs and white eggs. We ordered these chickens from the internet. So I'm not really sure why they think they're better than us, but it's like every time you go out there to get them, you need to like ask permission for taking the eggs. It's just part of my story. Um, But I want us to examine the egg because at my house, we eat eggs for basically breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're constantly trying to figure out how to use eggs. Um, So I Googled, thinking about you guys, how many ways are there to prepare eggs? Because how many of you know when you have something at your house, like there's a lot of it, like if your mom went to Costco or Sam's, and you think, when does this box of chips or crackers or sandwich meat or bread, when does it end? You know, like, we've got to make it happen. That's eggs at my house. Did you know there are 99 ways to prepare eggs? Exactly. That's what I said. Impossible. But then I found the list. So there are 99 ways. And here's what I want to tell you. I I want you to think about not just eating eggs and your favorite way of eggs, and if you think eggs are gross, whatever. I want you to think about how did we get to the understanding that there are 99 ways to prepare eggs? risk, right? Somebody had to risk burning. They had to risk, uh, what? Breaking an egg. What else? What was a risk? Overcooking? Right, right, right. They had to, they had to take risk. In order for any type of egg preparation to get into a cookbook, there had to be, uh, some type of, hey, I made these eggs. Will you try them? The answer for me usually is probably going to be no, because I only take them like three ways. But inevitably, a person's going to take risk, and as you take a risk with someone else and they come along with you, ultimately, that's leadership, right? I I want us to think about leading through the lens of an artist today in the sense of we're all going to have to take a risk, but it's going to make you a better, well-rounded leader when you lead in a way that maybe you've never thought about leading before. Does that make sense? So I want us to answer three questions in our time. What is an artist? What keeps you from being an artist? And what can you do to lead through the lens of an artist? A lot of you are writing that down. Do I need to repeat it? You good? Repeat it? Got you. All right. What is an artist? What keeps you from being an artist? And what can you do to lead through the lens of an artist? I love it. Look at you go. The best thing ever is like a really nice pen when you're writing down. Anybody else? I'm real selfish about my pens. I'm not going to lie. I probably need a freedom group about it. Here we go. What's an artist, all right? There's not really really a whole lot of rules for an artist, right? People often want a pathway to creativity, but there's not always a path. Sometimes it's going to require you to pioneer. It's going to require you to maybe get uncomfortable, to maybe get outside of the box, and sometimes even get outside of your own mind, like what is happening around me in, in order for me to be an artist in this moment. The dictionary defines an artist as one capable of conceptualizing an emotion or idea. Someone who can express themselves themselves through imagination, right? I would define an artist as someone willing to bring life and language to a moment to unify a group of people. We don't create art for the sake of art, and we're not artists for the sake of being artists, right? You're an artist when you're innovating, shifting, dreaming, giving effort, ultimately taking a risk. That's that's art. And notice I haven't mentioned anything about the abstract. We're not talking about paintings or poems, which they're still by definition art, right? I think great artists are just great storytellers. Shameless plug for the Chasing Elephants podcast, if any of you ever listen. 
Like the catchphrase is what? If your life is a story, we want to help you tell a good one. That's art. And here's, here's what I want to make a case for really quickly. Uh, let me tell you why you're an artist, all right, to help you believe this. Because some of you may be uh, sports guys. You may be uh, engineering minds. It may feel like very abstract and hard. And then some of you may be like, oh, I love art. I'm, a, I'm an artist at heart. Give me all of the chicken stories and the egg preparation. I'm here for it, right? You're an artist because you've been created and crafted in the image of the divine, loving, and merciful artist himself, right? Who loves to live with his creation. And let's be really clear about God's design for you as the ultimate artist. He doesn't mess up, okay? He doesn't regret making you. He doesn't decide all of a sudden you're not good enough. He doesn't reject your attempts to know him. He's a good, Psalm 34, 8, and kind, Romans 2, 4, and faithful, Deuteronomy 7, 9, God. That's who he is. And when we know the character of who God is, we can begin to understand how great of an artist he is. And if we're made in his image, right, then we have that art inside of us. That's the goodness of of who God is, right? Let me pause and say this right here. This is why we are not to contort or distort the art that's been created in and through us. And I'm going to just kind of walk out on a limb here, but I want to say it with tons of gentility and tons of just uh, love. You live in a generation where people decide that there is a choice between what the art is is or is not that has been created by God. So when they don't care for it or when they think it doesn't belong to them, they begin to alter, they begin to change. And I say this so much with great sadness, not judgment. We're walking through this moment with students in our own community right now. I just want to tell you that our enemy is willing to do whatever it takes to make you believe that the art that is you is not enough or is incorrect. And that is not true. That is not who God is. You are not a mistake and you were not mistakenly made. I want you to write that part down. You are not a mistake. You can write it in first person. I am not a mistake. I was not mistakenly made. It's important for you to know because you can't lead through the lens of an artist. You can't lead in general if you don't have the ultimate leader in Christ, right? I'm sure we've talked about this week, that this week. But we can't go a step further and say, I've been made in God's image. Therefore, I can lead with him and in him and through him. Because all things were made by him and for him and to him, right? I can't do these things if I don't understand that Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Friends, can I just tell you, don't count yourself out. Just as you are right now today, you can lead right now in this moment, through the lens of an artist, because you were created by the artist. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody take a deep breath. (sighs) I love a good breath break. And just say, I'm an artist. I want you to say it out loud. That's exactly right. And maybe write it down if you need to. I'm an artist. You are not a mistake. You are not mistakenly made. You were created in the image of God, and because that, you bear the image of the artist. All right? We're going to answer the second question. What keeps you from having an artist lens? And I would say that a lot of people shy away from having an artist lens because there's no guarantees, meaning that failure might be an option. Fear of failure will keep you from having an artist lens. But I want to challenge you and say you've got to change your mindset about this type of thing. 
failure is not the end. It's just one more step to finding the best way. So just because you failed at trying something new, at leading in a different way, doesn't mean that you are a failure. It just means that it's not this way, let's try another way. There's got to be a resilience to it. I would say don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid the possibility of failure will keep you from leading. Failures, honestly, I mean, I've lived long enough, and I'm sure some of these leaders who have some life under their belts will tell you, failure's going to happen. But it's not the reason to not try. It's not the reason to not step forward. Think about it this way, biblical perspective, David. You guys remember David and Goliath? Yes, a lot of times we think about David and Goliath through the lens of like David just goes out and he whips the giant with the slingshot and the stone, right? But really the art of the story is what leads up to David's defeat of Goliath. David only goes out to see that there is a giant because he's obeying his father. His father said, hey, I want you to take some food to your brothers. Your brothers are out at battle. David hears what's going on. He starts trying to rally everybody together because obviously they're terrified. They don't want anything to do with this giant. David comes in. He's the only one that's talking sense to everybody. And so what do they do? They try to do things. The king tries to lead David in his rally like he's always done it, right? He puts on his tunic and his armor on David. Let me rephrase that. He takes his tunic and armor, and he puts it on David, right? And it doesn't fit. So what does David do? Do you guys remember? Yeah, he takes it off. He doesn't use it. He takes the things that he knows will work, the slingshot. He goes out to the creek bed, as we would say, where I'm from, and he picks out five smooth stones, and he goes and he ultimately defeats the giant, The point is he knew he couldn't fail with God on his side. He wasn't trying to figure out how to win or that he wasn't trying to ask the Lord, hey, I I hope that you let me do this. He knew that no matter what, if he would approach the giant in a way that he knew that God was asking him to do, that the Lord would give him the victory. Now, how the victory came is up to the Lord, right? When you're leading In a new way, which would have been new for the king, right? Because the king was trying to put his own armor on David. If you're leading in a new, creative, innovative way, you're going to always fall forward even if you fail because you're going to learn something new, right? When you're leading in a new way, even if it doesn't work out, you're always falling forward. You're always taking a step forward because you tried something new. I think another reason is rejection. Everybody say rejection. Rejection is different from failure. Failure feels personal. Failure is the fear of not achieving something. But rejection is the fear that you won't be accepted, right? This might be the hardest part of leading with an artist's lens because at some point in life, I hate to be this person to bear this news, but there are going to be some people that don't like your idea. They're not going to like how you approach something. They may not like you. That happens. But rejection will happen, and in that, you have to decide if it's going to intimidate you or inspire you. So I want you to change your mindset about rejection. When that comes, will you allow it to intimidate you or inspire you? To be an effective leader, you've got to be willing to explore possibilities even when it seems impossible. Can you imagine the Wright brothers when they decided that they were going to make a plane? You guys know the the first two guys that ever invented a plane were the Wright brothers, right? Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, 1903. You realize that their backgrounds are not aviation. The oldest brother was the smart one of the two and then dropped out of college to take care of their mom. So he learned through books while caring for his mom. The younger brother was one with a little more personality, a little more gusto. He was a little bit more of the fearless one. So after their mom had passed, they were in their like mid-20s. They bought a printing press. They learned business. They sold it. They bought a bike shop. They learned mechanics. 
can you imagine the first day one came to the other and went, all right, go with me here. What if we built something that could fly and carry a person? Can you imagine? What if you are having coffee with a friend and someone comes up to you and say, okay, you've never seen that before. Okay, here we go. Flying. Go with me here. No one's ever done it. Seems pretty dangerous. I think we can do this. There's going to be an element when you try to lead outside the box or lead with an artist's lens where you're going to have to put yourself out there and understand that fear and rejection can't may be a part of like the, the puzzle, but we can change our mindset to use them to our advantage, right? Be inspired. Don't be intimidated by that. Sound good? Everybody good? Great, great, great. All right, here's where I really want to land. Uh, what can you do? to begin leading through the lens of an artist. I'm going to give you three things because I know we love lists. They even uh, all start with the letter P. So somebody needs to be proud of me. Usually I don't do that because everybody else does that and it gets annoying after a while, right? But as any good pastor would do, I want to give you the three Ps of how you begin to lead through the lens of an artist. All right. I think that one could argue that being creative is one of the bravest things we can do as humans. And look at that in any context. All right. Maybe your creativity is art. It was, it's with paint. Maybe your creativity is engineering. Maybe your creativity is systems. Um, there is a story at our church that goes around uh, our, my pastor is a, is a systems person. He, he loves creating helping people find their, their footing in places. And I heard somebody talk about him one time and say, uh, a lot of people would be concerned about this, say this is our, our church and what we're doing, and they think about what's in it, like what are we doing inside it? And they said, but, but he thinks about the form of it. How does this make it, how does the form, how does the shape, how does the bottle continue to make it better. Think about every time they change a water bottle. I feel like the plastic gets thinner, right? The bottle falls over now. Like you have to be really careful. You really got to put the top back on it or it's going everywhere. Is this just me? Or maybe we've all graduated away from plastic because animals. I don't know. Everybody good? That's the same thing. Like I feel like even though they've innovated the water bottle just for the sake of, like Dasani's already changed their labels again right? We're no longer like dark blue. We're now turquoise. We're happy water, right? There's continual innovation to draw you in to what's happening. I think it's one of the bravest things we can do. So how do you begin to lead, right? Let's answer the question. What do you do to begin to lead through the lens of an artist? Here's your three Ps. Your first one is my favorite. I'm giving you my favorite out of the gate. It's to pioneer, I'm giving you my favorite one because I think it's the most important one, to pioneer. Now, immediately when I say pioneer, I think of Oregon Trail. I came from the generation of green computer screens. Amen. Right? I see you in that back. I see that hand. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. The game of Oregon Trail where, like, your whole family gets dysentery. Right? And then they, they drown in the river as you were trying to cross. And I never knew what a wagon axle was, but I always broke it. And I never had enough money to rebuild my wagon. So my family just walked everywhere like a bunch of gypsies and never made it to Oregon. I don't even know if that was a part of the game. Can you win Oregon Trail? Oh, you can. All right, you guys are smarter than me. That's great. That's great. But a pioneer is a person. That's immediately what I think of when I think of a pioneer. A pioneer is a person or a group that helps open up a new line of thought. A person or a group that helps open up a line of thought. And you can keep going with that. Or activity, or method, or technical development. You just pioneer. We must be willing to adjust the method with which we lead when we see that the current method doesn't work. And that's really hard a lot of times. Um, 
it's really easy to get the feedback. Uh, we've never done it that way. So we just don't do it that way. I don't know if it can be done that way. I've never heard of anyone asking to do it that way. Have you guys ever heard that before? Just do it this way. This is the way that we do it. And while there's a respect for your elders when, when things like that get said, I think there's a beauty in building something in a pioneering spirit that says, hey, no, I think there's a better way to get there. We must be willing to adjust the method with which we lead when we see that it doesn't work, right? As believers in like a biblical context and as a believer, we have to be willing to shift the method but never the message, right? So it's why sometimes uh, there was this great migration in the mid, late 90s, maybe for some of your churches like early 2000s, where drums just started appearing on church platforms everywhere, right? And there began this great debate among many leaders or among many church families of if this was right or wrong. And really, it wasn't about being right or wrong, I don't believe, as a worship leader for 20 years that walked through that season with lots of different churches. I just believe that there was a, a moment where we realized that the methods got to change, but we keep the message pure, right? It's always about Jesus. It's always about the gospel. Our mission to lead through the lens of an artist as a pioneer and as a believer is always gospel-centered. It's always Jesus-centered. If you're not really sure what that means, let me help you. Does this please God? It's a great question to ask yourself. Does this line up with God's word? Can I find this in the Bible somewhere? Which is a little bit more abstract because obviously the Bible was written in a little bit of a different context than us. But the message is still the same, right? If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the message is still the same, all right? Sometimes this means to pioneer that we're going to have to do something that doesn't make any sense. Biblically, like if we go back to the Bible, this oftentimes looked just like obedience. Noah built an ark. Nobody had ever seen rain. Nobody had ever seen an ark. I don't even know how he knew to plain wood, except God maybe gave him the instructions for it, right? Like not just the plans for the ark, but the plans on these are nails or how this all goes together. I don't know. I wasn't there. Please don't judge my ark building knowledge. Not the point. Ruth left her hometown. This is a level of pioneering and obedience. She left everything she knew to make sure that she held her commitment. Moses led with a stutter and lots of times a bad attitude to me. Remember the three boys in the fire? They just didn't bow. They pioneered for their own people by obeying what they knew that would please God, right? That's leading through the lens of an artist. I wrote some things down that I want to, uh, to give you that describe a pioneer. You don't have to write all these down. There's a lot of them. But here's what I'd love for you to do. If you hear one, I'll read them slowly. And if you hear one that resonates with you, I do want you to write it down. Okay? Sound good? Everybody say yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, here we go. A pioneer clears the path. Pioneers do what no one is willing to do. Sometimes that's just picking up trash, but I digress. Pioneers are not deterred by a pathless future, meaning I don't know what my path is, so they freeze. No, pioneers are spurred on by that. Pioneers are not scared of failure. They're scared of not trying. Pioneers are not critical they are conscious to speak truth. Pioneers are consistent. Risk takers. 
hopeful, hard workers, resourceful, take part in the beginning, meaning willing to do the little things that others may think are beneath them. They prepare, they practice, they ponder. They are a voice crying in the wilderness. Shout out John the Baptist. Pioneers go before they mark a route for others to follow. When you lead through the lens of an artist, you'll ultimately pioneer. Not always to something new, but always something better. All right, second P. First one's pioneer. Second one, persevere. They rhyme. I didn't even mean for that to happen, and it did. Something we've not mentioned is personality type. I know you guys have taken a personality uh, assessment this week, which I think is really cool. Um, but understand that to do any of these things, to lead with a lens of an artist, it doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. They all are welcome at the table. Um, personality type is not a prerequisite to leadership. Perseverance is. So be encouraged if you're an introvert and you're not quite sure. Or if you're an extrovert and you get told you're too much, pretty much all the time, which is me, every day, by anyone I meet. I'm just kidding, but not really. You've got to be willing to persevere because bad ideas are coming if you're leading with the lens of an artist, right? Because you're trying new things. As a songwriter, which is what I get to do a lot, we have a, a sheet in a Google Doc uh, usually that you songwrite with. So everybody around the room may have a computer, or you'll have a screen, and um, people will be typing away and kind of trying to figure out how to formulate where do we go and what do we feel like the Lord's saying and how do we want to formulate this and what is the creative you know, aspect to it. There's a sheet, uh, maybe usually on the next page, that we always title No Judgment Zone. And no judgment zone means this is where all of the ideas are going to like kind of get fleshed out, you know. So if we're writing a song about God's creation and I'm like, I don't know, I can't get cats out of my head. I'm just going to write down cats in the no judgment zone. And then when we go to lunch, everyone will give me a hard time about writing about cats. But I needed to get cats out of my brain in order to get to the better idea. Because it wasn't about cats at all, right? The song was about creation, so understand there's a perseverance level. Your first idea may not always be your best idea, but when you persevere, something's always going to come. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't grow weary. In due season, you will reap if you don't give up. Perseverance leads to blessing, blessing here on earth and eternity. Understand blessing is not getting what we want. It's receiving what God deems for you as good. Okay? Philippians 1 6, be confident in this that he who began a good work in you, right? God's masterpiece will be faithful to complete it. When you get tired, I want you to remember this verse. When you're not sure, I want you to remember this verse. Philippians 1 6. Okay? I'll read it again. Be confident in this, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Here's our last one. Our first one was what? Our second one was, right, and I apologize, but this one does not rhyme, be willing to partner. All right? The best leaders don't try to lead alone. They are always surrounded by a group of people that may think differently than them. The best groups of leaders, oftentimes you're going to find, are running in the same direction. They're on the same mission they're running with the same vision, but they all see a different path to get there, right? And a great leader can kind of help everyone flesh out the idea of, hey, we're going to try this. Now let's everybody get on board with this right here, and we're going to run in this direction and maybe see if this works. If it doesn't, we'll try the next. But everyone in your circle can't always think like you or you won't ever grow. 
As believers, we want people that are like-spirited around us, that are helping us move the mission of the gospel forward, but they do not have to be like-minded. My husband and I are pretty much polar opposites. If he thinks something is terrible, I think it's amazing. If I think it's amazing, he's like, I can see 10 things wrong with this. Hanging a picture on the wall at our house is World War III at all times. He's got out a level. He's got out a tape measure. He's going to mark the wall. He's going to stand back and analyze it. And I'm going to look at the wall and I'm going to be like, there. Nail it right here. And he's like, that might not be it. And I'm like, great. If that's not it, just pull the nail out, move it over a little bit. The picture's going to hide it anyways. Right? There's two ways to get there. I help him freely think a little bit more. He helps me stay grounded. A group, a great leader is willing to partner, willing to collaborate, right? If everyone around you only thinks like you do or likes what you do, then you cannot grow. Here's a biblical example of this. You ready? The disciples. Peter was loud. James and John were the sons of thunder. I don't think that was meant to be like a sweet pet name from Jesus. He gave it to them after he was, they were like, call down fire on the Samaritans. Let's obliterate them now. And Jesus was like, stand down. Grab some water. Take a seat. Take a deep breath. Sons of thunder. Right? Matthew was a tax collector, which basically meant he turned his back on their entire people for his own personal gain. Thomas was a skeptic. Judas was a traitor. Jesus let all kinds of people be a part of his mission because they all brought something different to the table. They partnered with him for the gospel to go forward. So we've got to be willing to pioneer. We've got to be willing to what? It's the second one. And the last one is what? Partner. If you want to lead with the lens of the artist, like how can I do that? How do I begin? What do I do to begin to lead through the lens of an artist, you've got to be able to pioneer, persevere, and partner, right? We're not going to fear fear itself. We're not going to fear rejection. We're not going to take it personally. We're going to remember the egg. If there are 99 ways to prepare the egg, meaning it takes three months for you to roll through all the different ways you can prepare an egg, then there's always going to be a different way to get to the next step right? If you feel stuck, remember that you need to just lead through the lens of an artist. Try to step outside your box. Try to step outside the realm. If it's always been done this way, what's a way that you can add to? What's a way that you can reshape? We can do that with honor. We can do that with love and respect. And when we do that, I really think that we're tapping into something that's a part of us that's always been in us because we were created by the ultimate artist, right? Awesome. Hey, let me pray for us, and we'll keep going this morning. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are the ultimate artist. God, thank you that we don't say that in the abstract, but we can see it. We see it in one another. We can see it in a sunrise. God, we are just incredibly thankful that you give us an opportunity to draw near to you. And as we do, Lord, you draw near to us. Father, I pray that everything that we learn or do or say, that we're not just trying to be better leaders, to be out front, God, but that we're just trying to do everything we can to live a life that pleases you and that points others towards you. Help us to lead through the lens of an artist. Help us to give you all the glory in that. Help us to pioneer and to persevere and keep going. God, help us to partner with others. God, we love you and we trust you with our lives. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, would you join me?